Kyle here from allmediareviews.bogspot.com. Another ran random artist feature. It's on Yes. Um, and I've just gone through my collection. It's just part one, of course, like a lot of these. So um, I have right here one of the many different versions of the first album, the 12th titled album. And this was in the late 60s when they, when they formed, of course. Chris Squire, Johnny Anderson, uh, Bill Bruford, uh, Tony Kay, and um, why am I spacing on? Oh, Peter Banks, of course. Um, this record, again, like the first Genesis album, was kind of psychedelic, almost popish, and you know, I've, I've not really spent lots and lots of times uh, listening to it, although looking at this quote, one of my choices was Led Zeppelin, talking about some festival or something like that, or something like a Melody Maker. Anyway, this record, I guess, I think of probably for survival, Sweetness. Sweetness was later in the 90s used on Buffalo 66. That's the first time I probably ever heard that song. Every Little Thing, which is a song, which is a cover, a Beatles cover, and I, I remember they played that live sometimes. I think they did up until even the 2000s, they would bring it on. Um, let's see here. Before and Beyond and Before, you know, and, and Yesterday and Today, they did a, uh, that's not actually obviously a cover of Yesterday, but um, honestly, I can't talk that much about this record other than just some of these little tidbits with this record, but, you know, they were getting their feet wet like a lot of those bands from that period of time. Uh, their contemporary stuff, even bands that were a little bit before them, like The Who, and um, uh, let's see here, I think Crimson, of course, but I'm just trying to think of the bands uh, even that were sort of not their contemporaries, but like Cream, Jimi Hendrix, they were sort of in that mix, but they were slightly younger, them and Genesis and Crimson, and um, uh, even Rush, technically over in Canada, formed around that time, but anyway, um, and I don't have a copy of Time in a Word, which I thought I did, but I don't, but of course, the title track is the song I probably obviously think of that album most for. I got a Yes compilation when I was just after high school, I think it was, and that song was on it. And that, I've always liked that song, even though it's kind of just a poppy, sort of folky ballad, um, very flowery, which I came to always associate when I first checked Yes out. Was just, they're just a flower band. But um, it's, it's just a very memorable, moving kind of uh, track. But um, I pulled up the track list just to kind of... Remember, I swear I have a copy just based on looking at the, the cover which had Steve Howe on it, which was later released, which of course he's not on. He's the same lineup on Time and Word that you had on the self-titled Yes. But um, this has Sweet Dreams, Astral Traveler is another one where they, that was sort of an epic blues rock piece. Um, no opportunity necessary, no experience needed. Um, let's see here. The, the six and a half minute, The Prophet. You know, I think Peter Banks' style of a guitarist, and he later, I think, would join Flash, but he was more of a blues rock kind of guy, almost like John Rutsey with Rush. And I don't know if they would have gone into sort of the progressive stuff as much had he been their guitarist, but I'm sure my friend John and some of the people would probably say, you have no idea about that. That's just my perception. Uh, having some of the members change kind of allowed their sound to evolve a bit. Um, and also, yeah. Anyway, so then, of course, the third album, the Yes album, when they did change the lineup pretty significantly, adding Steve Howe. Actually, they would add a new member like every lineup, but this is the, the album that most people got to know them uh, initially from best, I think. Um, and even when people are new fans, they check out. This is an, oftentimes the first album they check out. It has um, I've Seen All Good People, Your Move, Your Move, I've Seen All Good People, which, of course, I, I never even thought about the fact that sort of chess reference but also, I think it might be referencing or thinking, I mean, influenced by Alice in Wonderland, which is weird. Um, but uh, let's see, see here. Yeah, the rest of the lineup, besides Steve Howe joining and Peter Banks leaving, is the same. But, you know, Starship Trooper was also a, a song that was 9 minutes and 23 seconds, but ended up getting played on radio, although, of course, it was probably an edit that ended up on, like, your KQRSs of the world and stuff like that, but... Yeah, I mean, it's not a 180 gram or nothing like that, but Yours is No Disgrace, and I've seen them play this live. Yours is No Disgrace is another track, which, you know, I probably never would have heard had I not bought this. It never got radio play like a few of the other tracks on this album, and it doesn't get covered as often. I like the little keyboard kind of driven um, intro on that, or intro and outro, and just kind of the bedding. Perpetual Change is another song that's 850. Uh, and Adventure. Adventure kind of has uh, a cool Beatles element to it. I always think of the Beatles sort of later build up with the piano. Almost almost ragtime, but also I, I just kind of think of the Beatles. And of course the clap is on this, rec this record as well. And that is um, Steve Howe, basically a solo piece for Steve Howe, an acoustic guitar part. So his first 
uh, foray into the band and see how I've been with the band tomorrow, which I actually picked up their record at, on Record Store Day a couple of years ago. But uh, and like, like Yes and some of these other bands, musically it, it was sort of just kind of a sign of things to come as opposed to the definitive sound of that musician. But anyway, of course, after the Yes album came, I think that was '71. '72 was Fragile. I know they released a couple albums a couple different years, but I can't remember if it was Fragile and this was 71. Yeah, this was 72. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> and of course, this is the first album with Rick Wakeman. Uh, so Tony Kay, the original keyboard player, I don't know exactly what happened, but... And Wakeman actually had been talking and playing with David Bowie, but he got the offer to join Yes, and he decided to take take the Yes offer instead of stick with Bowie. Uh, he would have been on the, the Ziggy Stardust album, I think. I was right around the same time Ziggy Stardust came out. But um, And this is definitely, a, to me, a little bit step up over the Yes album. Uh, it, the Heart of the Sunrise, or Heart of the Sunrise? It's just Heart of the Sunrise, or Hots, as I refer to it sometimes, is one of the best Yes songs. Also a song that was used in Buffalo 66. Um, but that that is a, a terrific, epic piece. A friend of mine once said, if you want to listen to progressive rock, want to hear what progressive rock is supposed to sound like, you listen to Heart of the Sunrise from Yes. And, um, ah. yeah, no, and then the artwork, of course, Roger Dean, this is the first Roger Dean artwork. It's kind of classic, and it sort of was a sign of things to come also. But um, this record also, of course, has Roundabout, which classic rock staple. It's like six and a half minutes again, like Starship Trooper, they were getting long songs on the radio. Granted, in the early 70s and mid-70s, radio stations would sometimes play songs that long, or at least longer than they would today. Um, thinking of, speaking of radio songs, Long Distance Runaround also is on that, on this album, and that is more of a concise, shorter piece. In fact, when 89.3, the current, did their 893 albums, they, this was covered, they chose that track because that's the shortest track uh, standard track on this record, of course. Uh, then there's Mood for a Day, which is another Steve Howe acoustic piece, and The Fish, which it just kind of ends, segues from Long Distance Runaround into uh, into it, which is a Chris Squire sort of thing. I, he always, he's been referred to the bass player from Yes as The Fish, uh, into Mood for a Day. But yeah, no, I mean, especially for Heart of the Sunrise, this it makes this album so good to me. Um, and it's, you know, I would put this as a top three Yes album, so... I'll take care of that later. Of course, I have some of the live albums. I haven't been showing all of them in these series, but this is sort of a noteworthy one because I, I found that a lot of the songs took on a new life. This was, um, this came out... Wait, I'm kind of doing this out of order, actually. Yeah, I am. So what? So after uh, Fragile came out, <laughs> I'm not talking about the live album just yet. They did Close to the Edge, of course. And um, when I first got into Yes, it was Fragile and Close to the Edge that first kind of did it for me. I checked out Tales, the record, later and it didn't really click with me but um i actually used to, used to fall asleep with this album and sometimes uh parts of uh fragile on and it just sort of it's sort of like wow they're really surreal they're really out there but they're really inspiring at the same time but um yeah so this was this was sort of a lot of people considered the peak and oftentimes considered a favorite or the best progressive rock album maybe ever made not in my mind necessarily, but I still enjoy it. I kind of lean toward Siberian Katru, the last piece, as the uh, as a favorite because it's just sort of very upbeat and energetic, and the, the transitions are kind of easy to kind of stay with. But Close to the Edge is very mesmerizing, and its best moments are great. My only big qualm with it is I don't love how sometimes Rick Wakeman is using like an organ texture, and I've never been crazy about it. It got, it got too cheesy for me, but... Um, and then, of course, in You and I, which, um, that's more... It's not as kind of layered, but it's still layered enough. And I like the vocal harmonies, I think, maybe more at times than on Close to the Edge of the track, the tail track. But, yeah, I mean, it's, whatever, 35 minutes this album, 40 minutes, something like that. The two epic, or all three epics, really. Uh, and it's, you know, in some ways, as less is more. Um, and then, of course, this was the last album with Bill Bruford. You know, they, they kind of had, he had kind of done his thing enough with Yes, and he wanted to go on to some other things, but um, he, he kind of left on a very high note. So anyway, yeah, and then they, not his last, I guess that's not totally accurate, they did the Yes songs, which I was just showing a minute ago, the Triple Live album, and this is really, this, the songs take on a life of their own, really, and they're, they, they're improvised at points, or just extended versions, some of the solos. It's got a great set list from basically the Yes album, all the way through Close to the Edge, 
Um, not too much stuff before. I don't think there's anything, actually. Some of the solo stuff, Winter Wakeman, Six, Six Wives of Henry VIII is on here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I haven't listened to this in a long time. I just remember listening to this thinking, these songs sound now different, but almost better. And I actually, if I was going to just listen to my favorite mixture of Yes songs, I would have a hard time for this period not choosing this over any of the single studio records. It's just long, it's whatever it is, two and a half hours, but it's three discs. So of course, then Bruford left, and they had got Alan White, and they put out, thinking of maybe the reflection of a two and a half hour or whatever it was, live album, they put out the kind of opus of magnum opus of kind of at least visibility in, in classic rock and progressive rock from the 70s and 73, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was 73, Tales from Topographic Oceans. Now this version I have here is a disc jockey version, which has breaks. And I guess it's not incredibly rare, because I think I've gone on to eBay and found it, but still not easy to find. I actually was given this for free from a friend of mine, a former uh, classmate from high school, <laughs> happened to run across and he had it. But yeah, and this, this is a great record overall. Four songs, 80 minutes, one song on each side. The one track on here, which I think uh, I'm hardly alone in this feeling, is the, um, the Ancient is just a little too dissonant and too experimental at points that I don't perfectly, I don't really enjoy it that often. But the other three I grew to love after a lot of time uh, trying to get into it. And as like I said, initially this is the first thing I ever heard from Yes, and I didn't really get into it originally, but it just, a second assessment really helped at least for those three specific pieces, and even parts of the Ancient. The best piece among the four among the three even, I would say is Ritual. Ritual is tremendous. It's got that catchy riff and the drum soul in the middle. Um, but Revealing Science of God, of course, it's kind of spiritual, but it, it doesn't seem to get too cheesy, unlike a lot of uh, some of the Yes songs with, with Wakeman's organ sounds and stuff like that. I don't get, I, didn't, I don't find it to be too cheesy for some reason, and melodramatic or sp overly spiritual. And then the remembering has a wonderful atmosphere. Again, it doesn't go past, doesn't overstep its bounds in terms of, you know, sort of cheesiness. So, yeah, and I, I grew to really like this. Of course, Alan White contributed a lot to it, and I know the band had mixed feelings, especially on the tour when they did it, but, um, and then, of course, another member left and came. Which comes to my favorite Yes album, Relayer, and the end of this, the last piece on this video. This is, uh... You know, of course, Rick Wakeman leaves and Patrick Moraz, who'd played with previously, I don't know. I know he went into the Moody Blues at one point, but um, I don't know. They found him or whatever, but he, he brought like a huge jazz fusion element and very heavy jazz fusion. The song, The Gates of Delirium, trumps Heart of the Sunrise to a point in that it's, it would probably compare to Genesis's uh, The Cinema Show in that it's, it's just one of my favorite pieces of music ever. Um, and it's just so layered, and it's, it's just it's an adventure. Even though it's about war, it's sort of anti-war at the same point. It um, the battle section alone, and just the the, the tack uh, and the kind of counterpoints between Chris Squire's bass lines and Steve Howe and and Squire, and then some of John Anderson's harmonies. It's just, um, and then they, it ends with soon. Um, and then the, the second and third tracks are the second side, I believe. Uh, on Relayer. Also, I, I just kind of felt and found to, to learn to basically find those to be the most charming, or add to the charm, rather, of this album, Sound Chaser and To Be Over. Sound Chaser, even though it's quirky and almost like a Zappa element, has a Zappa element to it, um, it's a lot of minor keys. It just kind of has this kind of fun, quirky energy, even though it has that cha-cha-cha, cha-cha that some people hate. I just I grew to kind of enjoy that part of the whole ride through this album, that song. Um, and To Be Over is just a beautiful piece. I always think of Hawaii, the whole, you know, pedal steel guitar on that piece. And it, it goes on for nine minutes, but it doesn't seem like it's that long. So this is the, my favorite Yes album. It's a five-star album. Um, even though it's got this dark kind of imagery, it's all gray with the snake and stuff. So anyway, that's part one of the Yes series. So we'll see you next time.